Good morning, or indeed good afternoon, everyone. My name is Glenn Adamson. I am the host of Design in Dialogue, um, which is presented in collaboration with Friedman Benda. We have the great pleasure today of welcoming to the program GT2P, Great Things to People, the Chilean Design Collective. Just a few housekeeping in, uh, announcements to begin with. First of all, uh, those of you who are joining us live are muted to ensure audio quality. If you are watching us live, please go ahead and tell us where you are Zooming in from. We always love to see that, where our audience is. And also just put questions for GT2P in the chat box as we uh, speak, and then we will get to them at the end, the last uh, 10 minutes or so of the conversation. And of course, the interview, as always, will be posted live after the fact, so you can always watch it again later, send it to your friends, um, and um, study up on the wonderful, magical world that is GT2P. Hi, guys. Welcome to the program. You're all <laughs> in from Santiago in Chile. Yes. Hi, Glenn. Hi, Glenn. Hi, Thank Glenn. you for having us here. So we have... We have Guillermo, Tamara, Sebastian, and Victor. Hello, everyone. Um, it's uh, great to have you on the program. Of course, you have a long and happy relationship with Friedman Benda, and we'll be looking at some of the exhibitions you've done at the gallery over the years, and also a fantastic and exciting new commission called Conscious Actions, which is uh, just completed this week for Design uh, district in Miami. So we'll be looking at that at the end. Before we start looking at images, I just was wondering if you could each introduce yourselves and say a little bit about what your role in the studio is. Yeah. Hello, my name is Tamara. Uh, I am architect and the craft maker at the studio. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Victor Imperiale. I'm trained as an architect as well, and I uh, run the computational design area at the studio. Number crunching. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, kind of, yeah. Okay. I'm, uh, I am Sebastian Rosas. Uh, I'm an architect too. I used to share the creative work with my partners, and I what I really like what I really like to work in is uh, prototyping in any kind of uh, digital fabrication uh, process. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Guillermo. I'm Guillermo. Uh, I am the creative director of the studio and I like to work very, very transversal in the, all the duties of the, of the studio. So yes, I also am uh, trained as an architect. Yeah, okay and frequently the spokesman for the group as well. Um, <laughs> and you're going in that capacity, you're going to be bringing us through uh, an amazing series of images. We have over a hundred images of the studio's work to look at. So let's go ahead and get started, Guillermo, if you want to share. Yeah. your screen. And um, what we're going to do is try to get through the history of the studio, uh, which is a short history, relatively speaking, but an intense one. And also talk about some of the key ideas that have guided your work, uh, starting with this idea of para crafting. So uh, Guillermo, take it away. Thank you. Well, um, you are seeing a picture of four partners, but we look like the, the, the but we work like the drawing. <laughs> we, we're more like that. So here I would like to show you some pictures of our studio. We have, we are <laughs> in a mid-century house. Uh, um, built by Miguel Launer architect, a very, uh, an hero of us. We have some tools like a 3D printer uh, designed by ourselves uh, in collaboration with an engineer. Of, uh, an engineer. Um, and here we can see some tools and our lava lab, for example. Here's where we melt uh, uh, the volcanic rock in our studio. Basically it's a ceramic studio uh, we have a kiln, we have some pottery wheels, we have a uh, roller slab, some extruders, and other uh, kind of uh, interesting tools. Here is also <laughs> our uh, um, natural laboratory. <laughs> mm -hmm. Basically, it's the mountain range, Andes Mountains range. So here is where we source the material. And um, uh, one is from the volcano Sorno, and the other one uh, on the on the your right is the um, 
Laguna del Maule complex, the volcanic complex is like the our Yellowstone, but it's in the high, in the in very high volcano. So here we can find obsidians. Well, so in honor to this one, we did the first thing you will see uh, when you come to Chile. So this is a, a, mu a wall mural we did for our airport. Airport. Maybe Victor can explain this uh, a bit. Yeah. Right? Well, we wanted to start with this project because. It's the first thing you, you will see when you came to visit us here in Chile. Um, and this is a wall mural in copper. And uh, it's um, a reconstruction of the Andes mountain range, right? Uh, and the reconstruction is with the sound of a poem of a, a very known uh, poet in Chile, Nicanor Parra. And the poem is the imaginary man. So it connects with the series of the, the world mural is imaginary geographies. So we reconstruct the sound uh, with a se sequence of numbers and we get this, this uh, mountain range reconstructed with, with the sound. A way to say welcome. <laughs> but just to be clear, what you're using here is the actual shape of the sound waves. Exactly. So Sound yeah, air. we yeah. translate the sound into numbers, and the numbers then instruct to curves and to geometry. Right. And those curves also <clears throat> works for for uh, are the cutting files and the, the CNC files for for make the, the project. And we also see here a theme that will uh, come up over and over again, which is that you're using a modular element that has a unique application of the process applied to it. So each of the copper strips is the same, but it has a different shape applied to it. So it's kind of like a mass customization strategy. Exactly. Actually, exactly. actually that is one of the most important thing, one of the most important thing here in parametric design, I think. I will show you this uh, very quick video. Um, this one was of our first pieces with it. It's called Suple. Uh, Basically, uh, we stole an idea of um, uh, Jean Prouvé re regarding the continuity of the things, and we see that idea in the in the branch uh, in the in the in the nodes of the trees. So, why to design one if we can design the rule that builds all those kind of noise uh, 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 nodes? Sorry. So, so uh, excuse me. So here you see uh, basically the the interface. This interface is Grasshopper, of course, and these are the parameters that manage uh, the the shape. So this has two functions. One is to 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 control the shape, but also diminish the time you use for uh, for for drawings, for example. So here you can. Uh, spend more time in designing more than documentation and there is a, a the, the most important part for us is if you vary the, the if you modify the variables and you cross that with a function is where uh, the, the the parametric power appear because you can create a family of things more than creating just one object that is the powerful full thing for example if you cross it with a with a joint for a table or just simple and structure. But here's the important thing, to create a family of things. Right. So this right? is the idea of parametric crafting or power. Yes. Yeah. In in the, in the, no, I think it's the general. It's yeah. the general term, I think. Mm. It's the global one. Mm. Um, so here, for example, for our our show, we create uh, this uh, bench, this uh, oversized bench, uh, very intentionally. <laughs> you will see in the in the further in the presentation. Uh, so, for example, for example, here we wanted to say that uh, we can um, mix uh, our traditional heritage related to the more modern industry related to. Uh, a standard custom, a standard production with uh, uh, mass customization. So we don't have to rebuild everything. We have to join both worlds. Of course, uh, uh, stand over the nature uh, and appear, for example, a light system 
And what if we connect uh, spaces uh, instead of uh, axes and appear this uh, another series? But here we can see that we are uh, uh, we are showing a kind of uh, expression of the of the computer uh, and it's, it's totally produced by the CNC and then it's totally handcrafted. So there is a kind of mix, right? Yeah, I just want to um, underline something you just said, Guillermo, which is because it's very telling about the way you work, that what you did was substitute the axis that occurred in the souple, like the bench that we just saw in the light, and you substitute yeah. for that axis the volume, this open space. So you're just substituting another variable into the same kind of logic. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's correct. Um, so th th that again, with one rule of design, we can create a family of, of things. So that is why it's so also, also super important for us to work with commissions because with the desires of the of the clients of or or the appear a new object. So it's super beautiful to have that that combination. Mm. Uh, desires from other guy to have an special uh, piece, for example. And here is the series that uh, comment uh, previously, Victor, is related to imaginary geographies. So um, here we can visualize exactly the, how can I say, the expression of the sound in the computer on these surfaces. So for the production of this, uh, this table, um, we use a very uh, tool, very, uh, very fine finishing tool to recreate exactly the interpretation of the sound in the computer, right? Mm. So this is a kind of a geography where, where it's, it's beautiful visually as well because it has many uh, layers to see, uh, many uh, visions from this, from this uh, view, you can see a kind of uh, sculpture, but when you go close, uh, you have some memories from uh, our landscape. Right, but to reproduce that memory, uh, basically um, we use a, a very, very fine uh, tool to recreate those uh, uh, hills, for example. But what if we increase the, the size of the tool that create this, uh, this object? It happened this one. It happened this. Uh, because, and, and here we are trying to make a, trans, a transition between the computer to the expression of the production process. Mm. So here you can see the tool that is carving the, the wood. You, you, you can see the, 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 the ways that ha, uh, how the, the, the tool carved the wood. So in all the intersection, intersection uh, path uh, is the, the beautiness of this uh, piece. So there we have another situation where you changed one variable, in this case, the size of the tool head, and you got a very, very different expression, very different aesthetic expression. Yeah, but managing by the sound. So it's, it's, it's great to have two different expressions, just changing a, a variable. But I like the idea that in the, here, the, the shape is more related to the result of, of the taking advantage of the expression of the machine more than what, what exactly we want in our brain. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it expresses almost the character of the carving tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here we go out totally from the computer. Hmm. So in this project, we were doing uh, Losing My America. That was a series of iconic pieces we did with artisans. And we asked ourselves how we can explain to anyone uh, even to people who don't know nothing about the computers, what is parametric design? So we designed this device. But basically it's a numbered fr uh, a frame numbered uh, uh, where we hang a cloth. Here we, we can see a video. I will do the, I will go. So there are some, uh, these anchor points that have, uh, the possibility to record the coordinates. So basically we hang a fa fabric and we put, uh, when the fabric is located, we put porcelain in that fabric, mm. right? So here is where we can adjust the shape. So when we adjust the shape, 
uh, there is a, a period of time that uh, the porcelain is stopped, uh, passed through the fabric, and we have to remove the excedent with the syringe. So um, when we remove that, all the thing attached basically is the, is the, is the, the final piece. Mm. So I think this project gives us a new scope in the studio in that period of time that is more parametric and less digital. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, or, or more parametric hippie. <laughs> parametric hippie, yeah. So what you're doing effectively is taking the logic of an algorithm, yeah. and that mathematical logic of the parametric design, and you're taking it out of the digital space and into physical space. So you're yeah. showing people what algorithmic systems look like in an entirely material realm, which is so innovative and so fascinating. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So, but 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 it, the good thing is that this uh, born because we want to explain some uh, something to someone. But yeah. That that is beautiful, uh, and here you can see the expression of the fabric, uh, all the texture of the fabric. You can see how many was uh, how many times was uh, layered or filled with the with the slip, and in those pieces we add colors, for example, for for amplify that that expression. Mm. So um, we, we realized that we can take an advantage uh, the translucency of the porcelain um, and, show, and, and, and amplify that expression. So um, we create this kind of lightings uh, that also were part of our exhibition. And if you can see, there is a little, a little dot in the middle. So that little dot uh, is super important <laughs> because uh, one day at the studio, we had a lot of um, volcanic stones that a client uh, gave us doing a job. Of course, Victor is from the volcanic zone. He, he born there. He was born there. And uh, basically, our guess it was: what if we put a little chunk of of, uh, of volcanic stone over a porcelain? Because it, the temperatures are almost the same. So it happened. So <laughs> when, when, when we put the, the little chunk over the, the porcelain, it get melted and attach it because of the cooling process. So and it works. The volcanic stone melts in the kiln as the porcelain is being fired and they fuse together into one. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And we create this kind of lights. This is super important for us. Um, um, and then we ask ourselves why we don't make an entire project with lava just because we know this is so you can explain the epiphany moment yeah <laughs> so when we we had some little porcelain pieces at the studio and somebody i don't know who in the studio put some little rocks over the vase and then put it into the oven and when you take it out the, uh, the rock piece was totally melted and attached to the porcelain. And we said, whoa. <laughs> no, but, but I the, mean, new, the new material has, uh, has burned. No, I mean uh, the epiphany moment in general, when, when you, the, the moment of ah, happy. Okay. As, as, as Guillermo said, uh, when we started the studio, we were very focused on digital design. And with the time, we start to think that what we really wanted was to make the things real, you know, materialize their ideas. And maybe that's the most happiest moment that we used to have is when an idea become real. Mm -hmm. And when you see, when you think that maybe the rock can be attached to porcelain, you have a kind of a wreck a moment. And we live for that moment. So if we are doing a big architectural piece and we make the prototype and we can see that it works. It's a happiness. Uh, it's a full happiness. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a good definition of what design can look like in the 21st century, the materialization of digital possibilities, because we have all these new tools, but so often they stay on our screens and you're bringing them out into real life where we can actually experience them. So it's an epiphany for all of us, not just you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so in the, in, the, in the left of your screen, you can see solid pieces, solid process, and in the right one, uh, you can see coding uh, pieces. 
you, we we can quote we can quote any kind of um, refractory materials like stoneware, uh, ceramics, uh, porcelain, um, refractory concrete, among others. So here is when we where we source the material, a beautiful one. But there is a, an important thing in this image because all the, the, the powerful the, the the force of the volcano reveals the entire the reveals the entire geography. But we wanted to keep uh, the shape the thing we we wanted to cover. So it's a kind of how we can control that 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 thing, and the process of coding things uh, works perfect for that. So we can have that expression, uh, rough expression, but in a totally uh, controlled shape. So for example, these kind of tools uh, were super, how can I say, experimental. The, the, the re is a curve, uh, is a revolution curve. And that curve uh, allow us to, uh, try, uh, to, test. to test, exactly to test uh, what kind of slopes work better for, for, uh, for, um, for the lava, mm. right? And I would like to see some videos. So you're talking about the actual profile of the object, the curve. Exactly. Exterior. That is the way we, we collect the rocks and we grind them in different uh, sizes. sizes. And in that case, we mix with a kind of um, melaza. Or honey. Um, or honey, and that is the way we touch uh, um, in a structure, uh, stoneware structure. Mm. So you're using the molasses or the honey as a binder, and that will fire away when you actually uh, put the piece in the kiln. Yep. Yes. Yep. So they are the, the hands of the, the real maker <laughs> at the studio. Yeah. <laughs> so and and here in the kiln is where the magic happened, I think. Mm. Uh, yeah, with with the different uh, cards, we control the different shapes, uh, the the um, the texture, and um, and that is the idea. Uh, rough uh, or smooth or mm -hmm. uh, ripped ones. Yeah. So just to explain, oh. as I understand it, when you say different curves, what you mean is different firing curves. So yes. different increases of temperature over time. And what that gives you is a different expression. Different color and different uh, textures. Right, so it's another application of parametric crafting, in fact. So like the, um, the sort of material porcelain printer using the catenary hanging cloth, you have a set of mathematical curves that you're applying to the creation of the objects. But here it's temperature over time is the curvature rather than gravity. So we can see how different variables are being used to generate different kinds of objects and different kinds of materials. I, yes. hope, that, I hope that's clear to the audience. It's extremely, extremely brilliant. So I hope everybody understands it because you can see how the same logic is being shifted into totally different terrains of process and making. Thank you for the explanation. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so here you can see different textures, uh, very uh, rough or, or about, actually we, we realized that inside the kiln uh, when we, how can I say, we diminish the, the, the amount of oxygen enter in the, in the kiln. Of course, this is a very typical thing for, for a ceramist. Uh, we can get the oxidums uh, outside because uh, the, and appear this kind of uh, color. Basically a reduction firing. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and basically all the amount of this project, uh, we create an, uh, our first exhibition at Friedman Benda uh, and it was called Manufactured Landscapes. It was, uh, uh, I think it, it's, it, it was, um, very clever name, uh, but it was an idea of a friend called uh, Frederico Duarte, who wrote a, a, a brilliant uh, piece for Diseño, and uh, we stole that title for, <laughs> for, for our ex exhibition. So it's a way to say thank you to Frederico as well. Uh, 
So basically we connect our landscape with the pieces we created for the exhibition and in order to recreate a kind of uh, manufactured landscape at the gallery. So maybe Glenn, uh, you, you are more descriptive than us for, for the exhibition and you know better than us. Actually, you wrote the, the, the essay. Yes, that's true. Yeah. And having all of these objects together, I think it also made clear how important the landscape is for you. Um, the landscape of Chile, this idea of a manu manufactured landscape, taking that outside world and bringing it inside and into the objects, capturing it in the objects. So you really thought of the mountains and the rivers of Chile when walking through the show, different scales. And we love the idea of in some, some pieces to have, um, how can I say, non-determinated objects that you can use as you, as you want. For example, that one can be a coffee table, but also can be uh, a, a bench for use it in an open space. Mm. Or, or the totem on, on, the, on the back, it can be beautiful, use it for, for an entrance of a house. Or, or if you put many of these, uh, of these uh, stools, you can create a kind of uh, interior, interior garden, and not necessarily going to outside, but also can, can be go out, outside. Um, so that is why uh, we, we like to create this kind of, uh, kind of, how can I say, that the people can uh, adapt the, the use of the things for their own uh, requirement, mm. or make special pieces, <laughs> basically. So here you, can see, you are seeing a big bench so it's, it's a bit overscaled for exhibition, <laughs> but, but it, it has an, uh, a goal under that, that idea because we really want to also, as, as we want to be part of the collector houses, we also want to, to, to be part of the public space. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it, we reached the objective, the goal. <laughs> we, started with, we started with a public uh, contest. Yeah, yes. actually, the, the the first project was a public contest. Sure, yeah. So yeah. Um, we we love to be part of the of the public space. So here is an image of our bench at the Design Museum Gardens. So it's not it's 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 for to be used. So that is one thing we love in this project. Yeah. So this is the Design Museum London. Just to be clear. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Big, big, big thing. <laughs> we'll, we'll get back to the, um, to the use of uh, public space at the end because of the new Miami project. But could you say a little bit more about what it is that attracts you to the idea of working in public environments? Is it about meeting the audience halfway and getting around the question of a kind of elite marketplace? Or, or what is it that attracts you so much to the public context? There is a, an idea. first there is an idea that uh, we 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 like to um, to reach a big audience mm -hmm. uh, without compromising uh, the quality of our things. Mm. So that is one a big uh, issue because uh, here in Chile, many people ask us uh, why you don't create. Uh, Mass, mass production things. Uh, we, we can, but it's not our interest now. Mm -hmm. So our way to get mass um, a ma uh, to a massive audience is this kind of projects. So, um, so it, yeah, that is one of questions. Anyone wants to say something different? I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not wrong, but I feel we have some kind of, uh, in Espanol, sería como una vocación. Uh, or ah. for the public space because we're architects too and and the name of our studio uh, it's regarding to the same uh, issue yeah, great things to people we would like to make uh, things that too many people can use and and enjoy yeah so it's um uh, yeah our colleague mario uh, balesteros said it's a, a calling okay a a calling place. for the public space yeah, yeah. So, so it, it, but it allows you to retain the experimentalism while also achieving that kind of breadth of audience, which mass production doesn't necessarily allow for. 
Yep. Yeah. Okay. Cool. But probably we will enter in a new a new area that hmm. could be. Okay. Who knows? Okay. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> So here we are. We are going to to uh, to get an approach to the to the projects uh, we designed for our uh, solo exhibition at Basel, but we did it, that that solo. It didn't happen because of the COVID. Yeah. Everyone knows. So just wanted to to share uh, these projects. Basically, Monolita series is uh, is all also related to the coating uh, technique. But here we wanted to take in advantage the tools we had at the studio uh, and try to to make a very how can I say conservative way to make ceramics in order uh, in order to keep the exactly same uh, the same section in the entire piece because as many can know the maybe you open the kiln and it's it's a mess <laughs> so. Well, uh, here we wanted to to reduce that 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 uh, that idea, and uh, we had an uh, extruder, we have a pottery wheel, we have our hands, and we have roller slab. What we can do and appear this uh, this uh, object. Uh, we did some uh, like this one, like this one, uh, and all of those names are related to the thickness of the of the of the piece mm. you, uh, of the the. Thickness section in the in the piece. Uh, so we uh, this is a kind of dream, of course. Uh, try to go mod modular and try to build uh, architectural objects with uh, this technique. Um, I think this project in, 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 in uh, it's it is it's a bit slow project. It's, no, no, it's bit. It's super slow project uh, because. It, it requires a lot of uh, time uh, to get dry, um, to make all the all the hand works. It's a very laborious uh, project, but mm -hmm. at, at the end, is is it deserves <laughs> every piece uh, get uh, a good expression. Uh, this uh, actually, this piece is already uh, on exhibition at Good Had Been uh, at the gallery now. Yes, the current show at Friedman Banda. What would have been which is just to explain that's a survey of the year's activity in the worlds of the various designers working with the gallery, but a lot of projects have been interrupted like your presentation at Basel. So the gallery has tried to tell those stories and all at once, fascinating project. And we see here the incredible subtlety and seductiveness of the surface of the lava once it's been transformed into this glaze. And then here you can see another effect. Uh, basically, this is another temperature curve, and 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 and, and as you can see uh, here, they are they are dry uh, in these images. We create uh, by hand all those these kind of drips. So those drips, uh, when they get melt, acquire the um, this uh, texture. So here is another project we are working on related to self-organization of the of the of the material, and I hope we, this ran good. So basically, here uh, this experiment is based. This experiment is based on a on a on a free auto study for their uh, their uh, ceilings. For his ceilings, uh, where he put sand in a in a cylinder, and but he just put two holes, and we realized that he's putting two holes. Let's put more. <laughs> 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 um, with that, we realized that we are recreating the algorithm, the Voronoi algorithm, the the typical one that everyone uses, but here in a very direct way. So here we are not representing nothing. Uh, here we are just the, the rep we are representing it itself itself the project. So I, 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 one thing I like here is the representation is not anymore. Here is just the material itself. So all the grains get very how can I say in equilibrium because of the gravity. Uh, they are in a in a um, in a thirty five slope. So they are they are super uh, stable. And we move carefully inside the kiln, 
and uh, we become them in, in stone again. So uh, uh, this is super important because we, we, we have to find the other temperature curve in order to sinter uh, the grains, uh, not, not melt, because if we melt them, uh, basically we lose the shape. We want to keep exactly the, that, that shape. And this can have very good applications. Uh, but for, for, for now, we are using actually the negative uh, for creating mirrors. Uh, the, the material that passed through the, the holes is this. It's the negative of the, of the other one. Right. So, um, so using it as a mold to cast other shapes, so you're getting the reverse of that shape. So it's concave, not convex. But, but, but it's not, we don't cast anything. No. We don't use molds. It's just because they are in equilibrium. I that see. is the that is the the, the good thing. There's mm. no molds required. Mm. Um, so here is another project we are working on. If we can extrude the material, we can make 3D printing, <laughs> basically. And this is started here, Seba. This is an, an older model we made in a very bad machine we bought perhaps ten years ago. That that three printer never print fine. <laughs> but we realized that when it was printing very bad, uh, we have a kind of expression by its own. And we said, maybe if we don't give, if we, do, if we remove from our mind the idea that the three printer give us a perfect shape, it can, be, it, it can be talking by itself with its own expression. And we saw how gravity started to create that texture. So we said, why don't we increase that and we, we, <laughs> and then we put a kind of virus in the code in order to disorder more the code of the machine. Uh, and then we found this kind of results that we call dysgraphia. That is a kind of sickness in which you, if you want to write something, the sickness makes you write it very bad. <laughs> and that's why uh, the project has its name. And then we, uh, it helped us to uh, study uh, how to create our own way to print. And we could hack the machine, we could create our own uh, grasshopper files to um, print anything. And that's the knowledge that has uh, stayed in the studio. And with that idea, we print something like this, the dysgraphia man, who is somebody who has a mind in a big disorder. Mm -hmm. uh, this kind of catenary uh, po potteries because we can also with the noise get this kind of textures. Um, so, the, the idea behind is that maybe uh, the three printed process has its own expression and maybe we can push in that direction mixing what digitally you think with the gravity and the material and the nature. So here we started experimenting that. Actually, we never published the, the previous one. It was, it was published, but in a very academic uh, uh, context mm -hmm. because we didn't uh, make something because it was plastic. It wasn't so too interested to us. So um, not because it's bad, because it's not interesting for us, not, not, nothing more. <laughs> so, um, uh, we started doing this kind of experiment, if this is possible, uh, and, it's, and it was possible. So here you, is, you are watching some uh, extrusion of uh, basalt, and, and they, get, uh, they gave us this kind of uh, color. Don't know exactly wh what is the component that is giving us that kind of green, but here we are using the leftovers of the, of the um, stone sheet producers. So this also opened an, a new idea. And here is, uh, we, we started uh, using the volcanic uh, lava for, ex for this extrusion. Here is uh, one temperature and this is too high, but I like the expression that you, you can uh, see. Mm -hmm. Here is another experiment where we uh, print in, in, in three parts, in three parts. <laughs> and then uh, we attach them uh, inside the kiln uh, uh, by temperature. So probably we can print in, in many parts and then we can uh, attach them uh, using the temperature. Mm. Some cladings uh, for walls or just simple expressions for, for things. 
Uh, and now you can see the, what things we are doing with our printer. Uh, uh, this is the expression. We are trying to, to use different grains uh, to get different, uh, of course, uh, uh, results. Uh, basically is printed totally in cold. Is 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 the same mixture that Tamara used for 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 the coating, uh, and we can get uh, um, results like this one. We we tried here to make a bench, <laughs> but it didn't it didn't work perfect. But appear these kind of uh, expressions that we can use. This is super important. When when Sebastian said that. Uh, prototyping is important, is super important because you can reintroduce that information we obtained from the prototyping to, uh, to the cycle, to the design cycle. So one and again and again. So it's, it's a recursive process, I think. Um, also, what seemed to be accidents on the first try might turn out to be generative processes subsequently, like what you were describing with the bad printer and then yep. that into an intentional distortion that is, of course, generating new forms. Uh, yep, mm -hmm. yep. And here is the first uh, structural thing. Is we did a little bench that is successful, but you can see here uh, the, the interior, the, stru the internal structure didn't reach the, the, the melting point. Oh. So it, it looks like the interior of, of the volcanoes that has uh, this kind of uh, brown color. So now we are researching how to to finish the piece, basically. Um, and here you will see the complaint, the, the compilation of all those pieces in the in the solo exhibition. We want the the basil that we didn't make it. Mm -hmm. um, the another monolith chair. Here we we wanted to leave those uh, little uh, drips in order to make more dramatic idea of what is this material. Uh, some fun uh, objects like this uh, side table. You know, I to ask you about this one um, because it, it seems like it's a little bit of an unusual step for you. It's not so driven by mathematics and the apparent necessity of the process. It's a bit more, I don't know, like Brain. a character character but it seems like some of the personality of the studio is coming out here yeah you mean <laughs> yeah I mean, it, it, i'm not going to say it actually looks like you guys but it has some of your spirit you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 i think that that spirit appear when 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 we have commissions so it, it's a good thing because it's a mix of something uh, uh, potential with an idea of that, that something born. So hmm. this is, a, is, is something like that. Yeah, cool. <laughs> and here is an, an, an example of the screen, uh, of the big, big screen. And yes, uh, we love this piece. This, uh, it's super dramatic, but also uh, we would like also this one because it can be go outdoors and we can create a, st a sculptural element at, at the for the landscape, for example. Mm. Um, this one is the self-organization project. We did uh, first uh, on a mirror. It's super beautiful, the, the, the frame that create. But also here is another uh, tweak because here we, ex we find exactly the sintering point in order to have all the little particles uh, micro melted, but not totally melted. Mm. So, in terms of parametric, we can say that the other th or the important part of the parametric is that you can uh, systematize, systematize the knowledge. So that knowledge can be used in other, in other project. That is important thing of, of, of parametric for us. And of course, this graphia <laughs> applied in a, in a base, for example or a super big dysgraphia uh, with a very thick uh, extruder. Um, and that is how it looks uh, uh, as, a, as a group. Yeah. yeah. First like time we, we saw them all uh, as a group. Hmm. Um, we, are, we are almost there. And many experiments from things we are doing. They do end up seeming like a, a family of objects. They talk to one another quite powerfully. Yep. Yeah. 
And here's some projects we are doing for public spaces. Here's the giant capture. Uh, it was a commission for, for us to make a bench in a big park. So how we can create something relevant uh, with a little bench. So we think that we have to catch the giant of the park. Uh, so that is why I appeared the Gulliver image here. So who is the, guy, the giant of the park? And we find him, he's the, the, the big mont mountain over there. So for that, we create two benches, one for kids and one for adults and a big uh, window. Mm. And using the souple rule, uh, we create the shape and it created the, the shape in between. And um, basically it creates an activation point for the, for the park. Uh, and we, you get seat, you, you catch the giant. <laughs> so basically it's a, it's a beautiful way to, to make, uh, to become our territory in landscape, in something that we can catch. Uh, so probably this uh, sculptor will be used for moments for uh, for catching memories, or yeah, romantic memories as well, <laughs> uh, or just to to a, a beautiful picnic during the Sundays. Mm -hmm. I was curious with this project, with this idea of creating a viewing position for the mountain, whether you were thinking about Mesoamerican ancient um, stone monuments that also organize themselves in relation to the mountains which are thought to be sacred was that something in your mind yeah actually there there, is, there are a lot of um, how can i say uh, it's an architectural idea i think uh, we can see also that in stonehenge that captures the the season uh, period yeah. Uh, yeah but it's a beautiful actually that idea of course, there, there are those uh, historical samples, but this idea, it came from, uh, uh, Sebastian asked me where I can put this uh, window in my apartment. <laughs> 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 and appear that, right? Mm. So this is an architecture idea. Yeah. Yep. Mm. So um, we received a commission uh, from uh, an, uh, a, a collector that he loves uh, totems. And he asked us, why, uh, if you don't make, a, make for me a totem? And we did something that looks like a totem, but it doesn't work like a, to a totem, because it works to look through, through the piece, not to look at the piece. So basically, we create for him an anti-totem. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so we create this kind of uh, uh, mirrors, also, uh, windows. And we create this object for the three different heights. So uh, the three components can be moved uh, to, to catch the views you want. Mm -hmm. and, and it works something like this. For example, if you want to, to catch your, your skyline or see your, the, the building you are going to, to build in the future, actually it, that is also anti-totem because of the, the totem is for the past or for the present. Uh, this is for the future. Mm. Um, and also you can catch your own collection or your dad explaining someone about the, your collection. And this looked like something like that. This is super stupid project because of the COVID, but it's going to finish soon. <laughs> Very soon. <laughs> So here the components are uh, are ready, but now we have we are creating the fixations. Mm -hmm. uh, we of course we can catch our our things, and it looks something like that. Is the interior a metallic glaze? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In in order to to have a kind of uh, reflective space mm -hmm. uh, that gives you out from the entire context. It's fantastic. Great object. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and to finish uh, our last project. Last but uh, not yeah. least. <laughs> huh? Last but not least. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, latest. Latest is the, <laughs> the word. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so here you can see also all the things we have been talked uh, at and, and, and the idea how the process itself expressed the, 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 the expression of the piece. 
uh, how we can use the, the actions of the process to, 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 to make the piece alive. Or for example, here you can uh, see the movement of this. Basically, uh, when you swing, the, the entire structure uh, moves. Mm -hmm. So it's under the idea of the curatorial team. It's no, no, it is an a response to the asking of the curatorial team and uh, before related to the energy you give and the energy to you ha uh, you turn back. Yeah. So basically uh, we wanted to reflect about, get conscious about your action, about that your actions have a direct impact in your environment. Mm. And uh, through this kind of playgrounds, I think it's super easy, quick and direct to explain to anyone and make the adults become kids. So when you are kids is when you learn fast. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe um, Lucy can help us to show the videos. But yeah. And the piece work like that. Yeah. And it's actually powered by the action of the swinging. Exactly. That's crucial. Yeah. Yeah. It's human powered. Next one. There, there are more. And th this was actually just completed in Miami, right? Yeah. It was two months of hard work. Mm -hmm. uh, we worked with an amazing partner uh, called um, Alt Build. They are located in, uh, in Atlanta. Um, and it was a, a perfect, uh, how can I say, uh, teamwork where Design Miami, where the Design Miami, Miami Design District uh, allow us to make anything. Uh, the creators manage all. Uh, the, with the producers, we, we almost live in, in Zoom and WhatsApp <laughs> yeah. uh, to make all the prototypes. Um, and to finalize, uh, we find a crazy photographer that catch all the, all the things that is called Chris uh, Tamburello. I think it's, 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 it's nice to realize that we can work from Chile and make things in the entire world with, without, uh, without moving from our uh, space. Yeah. So yeah. open us a, a big opportunity thing uh, here. So you haven't actually been to Miami to see it then? <laughs> you can imagine how we feel. Yeah, it's amazing to build that from a distance. But what's also interesting is that it has the same idea of curvature and the idea of a sound wave that was in the very first project that we looked at. So it shows that you still are thinking about some of the same issues, same forms. Yeah, th there are some things that we can repeat, but it's, it's, it's nice because they are part of other, other projects that we remove that variable from there and we create another one. <laughs> You know, what's yeah. also nice just seeing the videos is that when multiple people use the, um, the installation, you get different line. So it's, it becomes like a collective expression of the shape. Yeah, one, actually there is, I don't have the video here, but I would like, maybe I can share to you, but uh, during the prototyping uh, time, um, we were looking for different kind of waves. For example, if we use at the ends of the wings uh, web, for example, we can we have a uh, super straight, uh, super ordered uh, wave. But we uh, here we are using elastics. Uh, so here uh, with the elastic, we have uh, a result that is more uh, unpredictable. Mm -hmm. So uh, we decided to go with this one because that, because of that, because it's more unpredictable and uh, mathematically uh, uh, talking, uh, it creates a perfect interference when uh, one, uh, one swing uh, works with other in, in together. Yeah. And is, is the um, installation permanent or does it have a permanent home yet? Uh, don't know yet, but it don't know yet, but they are they are happy. <laughs> I have a nice spot in my house, so you know if, if it doesn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if if it's okay, I think maybe we'll take a couple of questions. Is that, is that all right? Yep. That's great. That was such a fantastic overview of your talk. I have to say, it was so exciting and 
uh, inspiring in so many ways. Uh, just a couple of questions we already have, and please, uh, if you're listening in, go ahead and ask GT2P anything. Uh, first, simple question from John Prown of the Chipstone Foundation in Milwaukee. He just wonders if the use of honey as a binder for uh, ceramic processes or stone processes is traditional or if it's something you just invented. It's, it's a super simple. We, we use uh, something for uh, cooking. Oh. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, not, it's not a tradition. It's something because first, at first thought, uh, the, the easy one was to use resin, right? Resin, yeah. Resin. Yeah. But all oh, the, 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 the smells and the toxicity was... Oh. So we, we started looking for more materials that could work like a binder. So we realized that a kind of melassa we have here in our, at our studio, mm -hmm. it works perfect. So yeah. yes, because we, we need in that case we need to attach to the structure and uh, in in the first pieces we use only water to put the the the, 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 lava. the lava and is when you when you cut um, is in español se se desarmaba. Ah, okay. So it didn't attach well with just water. See. Yeah, yeah. And that Indeed. was the reason because we, we tried to... Uh, to find another thing. Yes. Yeah, cool. Okay. Very ingenious. Um, <laughs> Ashwini Bhatt, a uh, ceramic artist, frequent uh, viewer from California, has a really um, important and intense question. Ashwini, are you um, still with us? Would you like to ask the question directly? Perhaps. If not, I can read it out, of course. Um, am I, can you hear me? We can. Hi, Ashley. Hey. Hi. Uh, sorry, I'm going for an appointment, so I'm in the car. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, this conversation was just beautiful. Um, so I, I was thrilled to see that you're working, taking inspiration from Nicanor Para's work, which uh, made me think of uh, 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 Raul Zurita's poetry as well, who writes about bodies of hundreds of people who disappeared during the Pinochet dictatorship into these volcanoes. Um, so two questions. Do you often take inspiration from poetry? Um, and the second one is, do you see your work as an offering or a prayer to the land in the memory of the disappeared people in Chile? Thank you. Um, it's a hard question. <laughs> yeah. Actually, Tamara, that, can I say that? Yeah. Yeah, it was uh, tortured and it was uh, exiled uh, from, from Chile. Actually, Tamara born in, in Nicaragua yes. uh, because of that. So um, uh, it's a big, big topic, but directly we didn't uh, make it yet. Um, we are trying to, yeah, not, not, not yet, I can say. No, probably we, we make our, we have one project, we express the, the expression of the ah, yeah. post-dictatura. Post-dictatorship. Um, yes, it was, uh, it was when we create a tarugao, it's, it's a base with wrinkles in the middle, and the idea it was a, a hang. It was a hang, <laughs> yeah. yes. It was um, like a... The, there is a, a very famous picture when the when a, a gangster of the of the of the dictatorship uh, he, uh, hack a policeman, and that policeman uh, it was the day that the democracy turned back, and that uh, that hack um, was become that guy that straight guy in someone that is also like us. Yeah. That that really wants the the democ democracy turn back, even if that guy is a is a policeman, mm -hmm. uh, because they were super bad with us. Yeah. Um, so th I think that is the, the the big approach related to that. But there is another, not not political, but related to 
to our how can I say uh, to 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 recognize our heritage that what's called losing my America. Maybe at the end of the presentation, I add three images of that. Maybe Lucy can show. Is this the fire hose installation? No. No, it's different from that. Okay. Um, well, Lucy. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that one exactly. Okay. okay. I, I can share that, Lucy, if that's easier. Um, and while I'm just getting that up, can you also just say a little bit about poetry as a um, as a sort of uh, source of inspiration for you? Th these are two parts of the, uh, there because one is is the message uh, of related to how you can for example in the imaginary man has how you you can transform your territory in a in a landscape in something that is is from you uh, so th that is one vision but the other one that is super br brilliant in i i like in many anti poets that is the the metrics of the of the poetry because it has an special sound it doesn't try to, uh, they are super formally as well, not, not, just, uh, not, not just content, they are super formally. So uh, there's, uh, related to how the things sound. So um, that is another uh, approach for, for, for our students. Maybe because uh, we have an interest related uh, to the, no, 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 that one. Not this one. Yeah. Okay. It's the other presentation, it's the 001. Okay, I'm not sure if I have that, unfortunately. Um, okay, it doesn't matter. I'll have to do that another time, but yeah, please continue. Yeah, that, that because, for example, I play music. Sebastian used to, to make music at his home. Uh, and uh, yes, I play drums, actually. Oh. <laughs> and, with Mark, uh, we shared a, a particular interest for Chick Corea, for example. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I think there, there is two kind of approaches. And also, uh, it's interesting because in some, po in some sense, our geography shape our culture. Yeah. Um, yeah. Our shape is, yeah. So more than celebrate the big ish, uh, big ish, no, we would like to celebrate the thing that shape our culture. Mm, okay. Um, I, I think we probably should come to an end now, but I just wanted to ask if um, Tamara, Victor, or Sebastian, do you have anything you would want to add before we stop? No, just I, I would like to complete the idea of Guillermo. We, we used to work with that combination between emotions and numbers, and, and we move in, in that uh, range. Mm. Just numbers, maybe, with just numbers, maybe we will not be happy, but, uh, and we, that's what we finally, we love. If you see conscious actions, it's an expression, mm, making numbers, the numbers make shapes, and I guess it's, it's a fluid relation. In that, in that sense, fabrication, digital, analog. Uh, yeah. we, we, we don't feel that there are some borders between those issues. To us, it's, to me, it's really happy to feel that we can move freely yeah. between uh, those issues. Uh, for example, one thing we would like to do in the next uh, Conscious of Actions is to create the Monster Eat version where we can produce uh, energy with the movement. So we can say that we, we are creating energy with the joy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, I think we'll bring it to an end there. It's a wonderful place to end on this idea of the two sides of us ourselves as humans, the logical number crunching side and the emotional expressive side and brought into such beautiful harmony in your work on so many levels. So it's been a really inspiring and wonderful conversation. Um, let me just say that uh, Chilean week continues this Friday on Design and Dialogue because we have Maria Cornejo, who is um, based in New York, but Chilean uh, fashion designer uh, with the fashion brand Zero. So my co-host Stephen Burks is going to be welcoming her to the program. So we'll look forward to that. And otherwise, let me just thank you again for coming on to Design and Dialogue. It's been great to have you and great luck with the rest of your projects. I hope you get to see um, 
Miami and visit the uh, swing in person and, and try it out <laughs> before all this is over. Okay, thank you, Glenn. Thank you, thank you, thank you Glenn, and everyone for thank coming you, here. Thank you, Glenn Benda. Yeah. See you.